All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Andy, and I'm excited to be here today along with Jackie as part of the workshop to talk about language as robot middleware. Um, when I think about the future, what I'm most excited about is one where robots are around us in the physical world, helping us with everyday tasks. And the theme of the workshop is trustworthy robots. Um, and I think this is a great topic because it's one of those things where I feel like we don't think about very often, but it's actually something that's going to be incredibly important if our goal is going to have robots roaming around in human-centered spaces, collaborating and cooperating with people. So then I think a key question for all of us to think about is, how do we engineer trust in our systems? Um, there's definitely a large body of literature around this topic in robotics, but some of my most favorite definitions of trust actually come from the HCI community, where much of the work there focuses on people interacting with computers, but I think the findings there are just as applicable to robots. And in particular, one definition that stands out is a more recent one from Philip Combs et al. Uh, in that trust can be viewed as a composition of warmth and competence. Uh, warmth captures several different properties, including is the system compliant? Does the robot subject itself to putting the user's needs first at the cost of being less optimal? Um, is it predictable to the consumer? And are those intentions perceived as being non-selfish? Uh, so this requires a degree of transparency as well as interpretability. Uh, on the other side, we have competence, and it's just as straightforward as did the robot do the thing? Um, reliability, uh, which you can measure with task success. Uh, there's more emphasis here on the capability of robots with the idea being that people are more likely to trust machines that get the job done. Uh, the work also did a bunch of experiments and made empirical observation that perceived warmth is more easily lost and harder to reestablish than perceived competent, uh, competence. Uh, and my interpretation of this is that for the purposes of building trust, uh, it may also be the case that dumb robots are actually better than selfish robots, which is kind of interesting. Cool. So uh, a robot can be a quite a complex system with many moving parts, perception, planning, and control. And we know that trust is something that should percolate everywhere. So where do we start? Uh, well, one thing to note is that trust between people and robots really begins with trust between the developer and the robot. And really, it's just a subset here. And for that purpose, I think we can actually learn a lot from ROS, the robot operating system since 2007, a common protocol that allows different modules to talk to each other. ROS was madly successful, uh, not only because it served as a unified message patching system, but also that it provided an entire ecosystem of visualization tools like Arbiz. Uh, and if you're like me in grad school, you use ROS because you needed it to use Arbiz and not the other way around. Um, so uh, it was really helpful in allowing developers to see exactly what was going on in the robot. Uh, for example, if you had a grasping system, you could visualize the RGBD point cloud uh, projected onto 3D space to make sure it was calibrated uh, to where you think it should be, build your deep network architecture to show predicted grasping poses, and then show the entire arm trajectory for motion planning. Uh, ROS and Arbis was great because if the robot was going to do something, it would show in the UI. And for the purposes of warmth and building trust with the developer, it was A plus on compliance and interpretability. Um, of course, the main downside is that uh, of all this is that you still needed a background in robotics. So to understand the fields and parameters in a ROS message, uh, which made all of this ecosystem restricted to only a subset of expert developers. But I think that we can still take a page from the book of ROS and uh, take a step back to think about the role of middleware that we build these systems on. Um, and explore what it means to lift this restriction so that even non-experts like your average Joe can work with robots and begin to trust them. Uh, so in this talk, I'll propose a specific form of middleware that I think could be interesting in this regard, which is uh, natural language as the glue that connects all the modules together. And in terms of an intermediate representation, I think it's well poised to be fairly expressive because it holds many of the properties that we look for in that it's uh, semantic, interpretable, uh, compositional, general. And uh, when language is treated as a first class citizen in a robot system, uh, not only do you allow easy retrospection for free, but uh, also you can use it as a means to proactively communicate with people, uh, things like behavioral intent, which uh, opens up much more opportunities in building trust for a human robot collaboration. Um, so why language as middleware? 
Um, on the one side, we have the advent of large language models and visual language models, but also we're starting to get some growing evidence in multitask learning literature that are starting to point towards language as the multitask representation uh, that we've been looking for all along. Uh, so to dive that into that a little bit more, whenever I think about generalized robots, I think about robots that can do many tasks. And if we look at recent work in multitask learning, a key question for the area is, does multitask learning result in positive transfer of representations? And uh, interestingly enough, in the past couple of years of research suggests that it's, it's complicated. Um, so for example, in computer vision, there's this wonderful paper written by Amir Zamir, Alexander Sachs, and William Shen, and others on taskonomy as CVPR. And what this paper shows is that if you pre-train on task A and then fine tune on task B, you can measure how much it improves task B. And then you can do this for all pairs of combinations of tasks like edge detection, semantic segmentation, uh, depth estimation, et cetera. So they've got this massive affinity matrix where the lighter the red, the better the pre-training transfers. And what's surprising is that not very many tasks actually transfer well. If you train an edge detector and then fine tune on depth segmentation, you might not actually improve downstream performance, which was quite an interesting finding in this work. Uh, we're also seeing a similar story in contrastive pre-training objectives too. This is work from my colleague Michael Liu and his lab led by Shane Li, where they observed that uh, contrastive pre-training only sometimes improves RL from pixels, not always. Um, in robot learning land, there's this interesting paper from NeurIPS 2020, Sam Torrey et al, called Magical Benchmark. And this paper investigates various imitation learning algorithms <laughs> like BC or Gale in simulated settings. But specifically what's interesting is that in the tables, you'll find that they also evaluate uh, a multitask agent. Um, you'll, you have 10 different tasks that you can train these agents on. And if you group up all the tasks together and train them on one large data set, you actually deteriorate performance versus training on a single task. Uh, so if you look at the numbers here, uh, you'll see that the performance for multitask is surprisingly not as good as just BC on single task alone. Uh, we're also seeing something similar in the recent Gato paper, which demonstrated an amazing system capable of training on so many tasks. Uh, at the same time, the performance that you can achieve uh, is still roughly only on par with baseline, uh, previous BC baselines. Um, so positive transfer is still relatively challenging to achieve uh, in the realm of multitask learning. Um, so you can imagine my surprise when my colleague Pete Florence pointed out that to me that a recent paper clipboard actually showed some surprising results where multitask learning, uh, when grounded in language, actually seems to be more likely to lead to positive transfer. Uh, a bit of background on clipboard, and this is not my work, this is by Mohit Shridhar, Lucas Manuali, Deirdre Fox. Um, from CORE last year, and specifically, they were doing a series of language condition pick and place tasks. Uh, if you go to their website, they have some incredible results, and they also have real world experiments. And one of my favorite ones is, is uh, this one here, where they literally put sticky notes of uh, written good and bad uh, inside two boxes and had the system be able to sort between the two, uh, which is just so cool. Uh, but the main idea being that uh, you could essentially condition a lot of the various uh, pick and place tasks on language instructions. Uh, and it turns out that uh, in their paper, um, if you uh, uh, look at the numbers, this is a really big table and there's a lot to take in. But what I'd like to guide your attention towards is the row that shows clipboard with multitask uh, training. And this is highlighted in green. And specifically, what you'll see is that the predominant uh, amount of best numbers are achieved with multitask learning versus just single task learning. And in particular, it helps uh, the most in the low data regime. Um, so this is actually one of the first times in which I've uh, personally have seen really positive transfer coming out of multitask training. Uh, and one possible explanation is could be that if you had language conditioning, you're naturally trying to focus semantic attention onto the things that matter. Um, so if you had an end-to-end -end learning architecture, um, the model might initially pay attention to random sporadic features that are in the image, but once you condition on language, that provides the inductive bias for the model to coerce itself into paying attention to the red pixels that actually belong to the red block. Um, so I thought this was very interesting. Uh, if you also go into the original clip paper as well, you'll find that they uh, have this, again, massive table with lots of numbers. But the point here is that every column is essentially a different computer vision benchmark. And uh, with uh, CLIP as visual language pre-training, you essentially have state-of-the-art numbers all across the board, uh, which is absolutely outstanding. 
Um, several other uh, recent works are also um, uh, starting to point to the fact that language is a way in which we can start to coerce these models to begin to overlap on and be able to pay attention to the things that are important. Um, so uh, a question now is how do we actually use uh, language as an intermediate representation? Um, and I think it's still an open research problem. Uh, there's lots of ways to do it, but uh, here's one way that I'd like to talk about. And specifically, this is from a recent work from our group called Socratic Models, composing zero-shot multimodal reasoning with language. Uh, say that you have a pick and place setting with a robot on a workspace. And uh, the main idea here is that you can take a visual language model, and this could be out of the box from CLIP, Align, Lit, uh, Sim, BLM, Bild, or Embedder. And uh, the main idea is that you can take a visual, you, you can you can take uh, the, the input human instructions highlighted in pink here, and then feed all of that into a large language model for planning. Uh, so it'll take the human uh, instruction, break it down into several different sub-steps, um, and then for each step, feed it into a language conditioned uh, policy at, such as clipboard, uh, for example, which is what we do in our case. Uh, and this is interesting because the entire thing is uh, basically operating on language. And the key thing here to pay attention to is how we're representing the state of the environment. Uh, here, it's just a list of objects, but there could be other richer ways to describe the scene in the future. Um, cool, so uh, I wanted to show a, a live demo of this in action. Uh, and here's a collab and I'll, I'll provide a couple links for uh, where you can download this collab for yourself as well, it's all open source. Um, the, uh, what this runs is essentially a PyBullet uh, server on the other side and we're just going to uh, initialize the environment and then uh, have it run object detection. Um, so the output here is from Bild and it's gonna give us a list of objects as our scene description. Um, uh, that we use to feed into the uh, language model planners. So one uh, user input instruction could be um, in this scene, uh, let's move all the blocks to different corners clockwise. Cool, so uh, the language model planner will take this language instruction as input and then generate a list of steps. And for each step, we'll pass it to clipboard. Um, to execute a pick and place on the server side. And then the, the server will render a bunch of images and visualizations and then pass them back over to the Colab client for us to see what's happening. Uh, so here, uh, pick the yellow block and place it on the top left corner. That's one of the first initial steps. Uh, we have a video here of what the robot's doing. And then uh, the next step from the language model is pick the green block, place it on the top right corner uh, and followed by um, uh, pick the blue block and place it on the bottom right corner. Uh, and so here it's also showing pick and place heat maps um, uh, that are coming out from the language condition policy. Uh, so uh, this is cool. Uh, we could also uh, say um, more commands like now move the forest colored block to the middle. And it's going to associate uh, forest, that forest means green, um, you know, something that is learned from internet data, reading lots of books, for example. So uh, pick the green block and place it on the middle. Um, so this is the uh, pick and place that gets executed by the robot. Um, and then uh, we can do things like uh, stack the blocks with the banana colored one sandwiched uh, between the other two. Um, yeah. Cool. So uh, uh, the system, most of the time uh, that it takes in running this is just the system uh, trying to render out all of the images and passing it back in the form of a video. Um, so if you were running this locally on your workstation, this would run much faster. Um, cool. Yeah. So that is indeed the, uh, uh, it first puts the, the yellow block on top of the green one, and then it puts the blue one on top of the yellow one. So that is indeed the banana colored one sandwich between the other two. Um, because these, we feed our dialogue or concurrent dialogue back into the language model. So the system is inherently stateful. And since they're contextual, then we can do things like wait, actually undo that last step. 
Uh, this is, uh, I've always wanted a control Z button for uh, robots, uh, and this uh, is one step towards that. Uh, Cool, yeah, uh, undoing the pick and place for the topmost block. Um, language models are also multilingual. So uh, let's just say that we wanna uh, open up um, uh, Google Translate and we can say, put the yellow block in the bowl you think it best fits. And uh, we can translate it over into German, for example, and then, uh, uh, copy paste this, put it into, um, put it into the uh, prompt here, and uh, see if it'll do the thing. Uh, and the plan that's being generated by the language model is pick the yellow block and place it on the yellow bowl, uh, which is kind of cool. Nice. And uh, uh, language condition policy successfully executes that. Uh, and then finally, we can also, uh, because everything's contextual, we can do, okay, now sort the remaining blocks in the same way. Cool, uh, pick the green block and place it on the green bowl. There it is, putting the block into the bowl. And then it's now uh, executing the next step, which is pick the blue block and place it on the blue bowl. And there it is. Uh, all the blocks are put into their corresponding bowls as deciphered by the uh, language model planner. Um, so code for all of this is uh, on the Circadic Models website. So if you just click on code, then you can find this collab down here. Uh, you can also find it uh, as part of the SACAN. Uh, you can find SACAN variants with affordances uh, down on the bottom of the page, and you can find that in this link here. Cool. Um, so uh, one particular idea that uh, these projects all revolve around is uh, describing the visual world with language. So rather than classic representations from robot perception, like Sixtoff uh, object poses or key points, uh, we've been hypothesizing and playing around with passing around language descriptions uh, of the state of the world between perception and control. Um, we can also incorporate this for uh, feedback too, to do replanning with uh, Palm Seikan. Uh, with recent work led by uh, Wenlong, Fei, and Ted on Inner Monologue. And uh, we show that by incorporating different pieces of language feedback from perception at every step of the plan from Seikan, uh, we can make a system much more closed loop, which is really cool. Um, of course, uh, you know, language uh, does have its limits in terms of an intermediate representation. So for example, it does lose spatial precision um, and it can be highly distributionally multimodal. So there's lots of different ways to say the same thing. Um, and it's not as information rich as in-domain representations like images. Um, but I do think that folks in the community are starting to think about ways to work around this. Uh, one fun example to call out is uh, a work textual inversion from Rinan Gal et al, where over the pre-trained word embedding space from language models, or in this case, generative models, you can probe the manifold to find a point on the continuous space uh, that represents a concept that can't be described immediately with discrete words. And this is cool because it effectively allows you to be more expressive than linguistic descrip descriptions, but still grounded on the language embedding and retaining all the benefits of its generality. Um, so they showed a bunch of cool examples uh, here where you can feed in model the, the model images of a doll with a specific texture uh, and then find the token that represents or find the, uh, the point on the word embedding space that represents that texture and then use that as input to a text to image model to generate a sports card um, made of that texture or a Lego or onesie or a Da Vinci sketch, um, which is so cool. Um, another perceived limitation of language is that it can only be used for high level reasoning. Uh, of the robot stack. We have Socratic models and inner monologue for perception, uh, Seikan, Wen Lang Huang et al. Uh, for planning. But what do we do about control? Do we still have to stick with imitation or reinforcement learning? Um, long, large language models have 
shown to store some degree of intuition and common sense gleaned from the internet scale data that they've been trained on. Um, but I think just one thing to note is that I think intuition and common sense is not just a high level thing. Um, it also applies to low level behaviors too. Uh, so for example, it can be spatial, um, move a little bit to the left. What does a little bit precisely mean? Um, or uh, temporal, move faster. What do we mean by move faster? We need something that can help us fill in the blanks here. Uh, or functional, uh, balance yourself. And uh, I think that if we just took uh, off the shelf language model like uh, uh, OpenAI's GPT-3 and we say something like, I am a self-balancing robot. If I lean a bit too far to the left, what should I do next? Then the uh, language model will say, if you lean a bit too far to the left, you should try to correct your balance by shifting your weight to the right, which is, which is correct. Um, and so my point with this example being that I think uh, low-level low behavioral common sense uh, seems to be stored in the depths of language models. But the question is, how do we extract it? Um, and with that, I'll hand it off to Jackie, who will talk about our recent work on CODA's policies on that front. Hi, my name is Jackie. I'm here to present our work, Code as Policies, Language Model Programs for Embodied Control. And this is joint work with many folks from Robotics at Google. Here we showed a wide variety of robot tasks, all specified in natural language, from tasks such as put the blocks in a horizontal line near the top to drawing a pyramid as a triangle on the ground. What these tasks all share together is that they require a degree of low-level reasoning and control, for example, doing spatial geometric reasoning, reasoning about object-object relationships, and performing precise numerical computations, uh, vector arithmetic, and so forth. So the question is, can LLMs also perform these types of generalizable low-level reasoning and control? Uh, and it turns out we can if we use code as the output for our language models instead of uh, natural language descriptions. And what we mean by code is that we'll have the language model write a snippet of code according to some natural language description of the task. And this code will complete the task by calling the provided robot perception and action APIs. The nice thing about code is that it can leverage classical logic structures like loops and conditionals, use third-party libraries like NumPy, and perform precise numerical computations. We can also use code to specify feedback policies in addition to plans, and all of these can be used to achieve uh, new tasks, novel tasks, with only few shot prompting and no additional training, similar to previous works that also use large language models to perform robot tasks. To make this comparison a bit clearer, uh, here's what the diagram might look like if we're learning a robot policy to perform a particular task. The policy could be a neural network that maps from some perception to some action representations. If we're using LLMs to plan, it could be taking in natural language descriptions of the task and the world and outputting descriptions of actions or skills for the robot to perform. In our case, the language model is directly writing code that calls perception APIs and action APIs to perform the downstream task. In the next couple of slides, I'll go over some examples of what code generation looks like when applied to robotics. Uh, in our examples, we always have a prompt that goes into the language model, and we think of prompt having two parts. Uh, the first part are hints. So these are descriptions, import statements, function signatures, and so forth. Uh, basically things that we only need to specify once. And then the other part of the prompt are examples, which are pairs of instructions and responses. So natural language instructions and the corresponding code to complete that instruction. Think of these as giving demonstrations to the natural language model. And already with this very short prompt, we can get the uh, large language model to output non-trivial code. For example, for getting the leftmost point in a collection of points, getting the center of a bunch of points, and getting the closest points. So note that these are using NumPy functions and NumPy library functions that are not specified in a prompt, sort of suggesting that for par popular third-party libraries on the internet, uh, these, are already, these are already in the data that's being used to train the code-generating language models. Uh, so we don't need to include those in the prompt. 
But perhaps more interestingly is we can get the large language model to write first party libraries and use these to uh, perform more domain specific tasks. So for example, in this prompt, we provide two APIs, uh, one's for perception API for getting the object positions by their names, and the other is a scripted motion pick and place primitive called put first and second. We give two examples of how to use these two functions, and already we can get the robot to perform new tasks. So here the new instruction is move the red block a bit to the right. So in the prompt, we've shown what left means, which is in the negative x direction. Uh, and here, there's some uh, amount of reasoning about uh, spatial relations, uh, spatial coordinates. And uh, to the right, it's using the positive x direction. Uh, and we also specified the uh, magnitude of this motion instead of just to the right, it's a bit to the right. So the prompt shows 10 centimeters as sort of this default magnitude that we're working with. So a bit to the right, the language model shows five centimeters, showing this uh, sense of uh, procedural common sense. And we can also get the language model to leverage its own natural language reasoning ability. So here the command is put the blue block on the bow with the same color. So we didn't have to specify which uh, color of the bow is, uh, and the language model is able to figure this out. Uh, to make things a bit more uh, capable in our method, there are two things that we're doing to support more complex commands. Uh, here the command is while there are fruits with area bigger than 0 0.005 that are also left of the red bow, move them toward the right. So this is a very convoluted command that requires a lot of different object relationships. Uh, and here is calling this function called parse object. Uh, this is actually just another, uh, what we call a language model program using another specialized prompt whose sole purpose is to extract object names from natural language descriptions. This is the output of that um, other language model program and this is sort of an example of composing multiple specialized prompts to do something more complicated. And in this particular uh, generated code, it's calling functions that don't exist. So this is a function called get objects bigger than area threshold. Uh, this function doesn't quite exist yet, so this is another thing that we do called hierarchical code generation, uh, which scans the generated code at runtime, detects which function hasn't been uh, uh, defined yet, and recursively define those functions by querying the uh, code writing language model. And so here's the generated function, a body for that, and it's also calling another function that doesn't exist, so we recursively call hierarchical code generation. And finally, we have something that we can execute, which it calls the get object bounding box xyxy, which, it, which is a API that we provide. Uh, so sort of a very quick summary of our course policies approach is trying to map natural language instructions to task policy code, which uses perception to inform action. And of course, this means that we have to provide these perception and action APIs for the language model to use. The benefits are the both the inputs and outputs are very expressive. Uh, we can use code to enable this sort of low level reasoning and control mapping language to um, uh, uh, API arguments uh, for action APIs, for example. We can use code to perform numerical computations that are much more precise than doing so directly with language models. Uh, we can solve new tasks with few-shot prompting and zero-shot training. I mean, here are all the benefits of large language models, such as supporting multiple languages, dealing with context, and performing dialogues with humans. Here we show some very quick results on uh, evaluating our code generation performance, specifically with regard to hierarchical code generation. And we show that both on the generic code generation benchmark called human eval, as well as our own proposed robot-centric robot code gen benchmark doing hierarchical code generation improved performance across the board. We also evaluate generalization behavior of our code generation procedures, and we also show that hierarchical code generation is able to improve generalization across different generalization types. And this is also seen in simulation when we evaluate the end-to-end -end pipeline to actually perform uh, robot tasks. Uh, here, we're evaluating tasks such as put the pink block a little bit to the bottom uh, of the gray bow. Uh, and on scene instructions and scene objects, uh, the performance is relatively similar with our compared baselines, but uh, the performance that, uh, of our approach degrees a lot less when we use unseen objects and unseen instructions. So again, showing that general Organization capability uh, of doing codeless policies and also doing hierarchical code generation. 
In the next few slides, I'll just give some quick robot demos of applying our method to a variety of different task domains. So here the command is put the red block to the left of the rightmost bow. So showing some uh, degree of spatial geometric reasoning. Uh, now move it to the side farthest away from it. So this is an example of using context, so figuring out what it means uh, in this instruction. Place the blocks in both with non-matching colors. Put the blocks in a vertical line 20 centimeters long and 10 centimeters below the blue bowl. So more complex examples of doing spatial reasoning. Uh, arrange the blocks in a square around the middle, making the square bigger. Uh, more examples of context and also uh, performing uh, operations on shapes. Uh, undo that. So uh, referring back to the previous command, so now we're making the square smaller. Uh, rotate the square by 45 degrees. Uh, we can also get the language model to uh, transform shapes, and it, this is mostly using NumPy and also uh, the library Shapely. We have some more examples of uh, in these tabletop manipulation domains. So move all fruits to the green plate and bottles to the blue plate. Move the smallest fruit back to the yellow plate. So this is using our provided APIs to getting the object bounding boxes. Uh, wait until you see an egg and put it on the green plate. Uh, that's an example of generating a while loop and put the darkest object in the plate that has the apple. Uh, and finally, I'll show an example of running our method on this uh, mobile manipulation domain. So here in the beginning, the user is totally operating the robot to different waypoints uh, in the scene, tell the robot where the uh, compost, uh, landfill, and recycle bins are. Uh, and then we command the robot to put away the Coke can and the apple in their corresponding bins. So now the language model automatically chooses uh, that the Coke can should go into the recycle bin and the apple should go in the compost bin and we didn't have to uh, tell the robot exactly which, where to put each object. So this is a benefit of using a cogeneration model that's uh, also a large language model that can have some sort of this natural language based reasoning and we can combine uh, these two capabilities to uh, elicit these types of behavioral common sense. Uh, as a bonus, here we also show the ability of our method to generate code uh, that balances a card pool in the OpenAI card pool gem environment. Uh, although additional research is needed to make this type of continuous controller generation a bit more robust, uh, in particular perhaps uh, using ideas from works like Inner Monologue to give uh, execution feedback to the language model in order to improve code generation in a more iterative fashion. And uh, to conclude, the takeaways for our project is that we can generate code as robot policies directly using these code writing large language models. Uh, and the generated code are, is using existing perception and skill libraries to perform downstream tasks. Uh, we can use code to perform this type of low level reasoning and control in a generalizable manner. Uh, hierarchical code generation improves code generation performance and task performance, and that we can perform novel tasks with few shot prompting and zero shot training. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, so with code as policies, we can begin to take initial steps towards uh, the role of language in control. Uh, but it also comes with its own limitations. For example, both Socratic models uh, and code as policies require a fair bit of prompt engineering, uh, which is still more of an art at this point and requires having uh, an intuition of the data sets that the models were trained on to find the right templates for a problem. Um, we do get compositional generality, but there's still a question of uh, where do we get the low-level perception and control primitives? Um, and of course, how do we express contact-rich dynamics that are front and center to uh, dexterous manipulation, like crumpling a piece of paper in my hand and having all that feedback propagate back to the high-level parts of the stack? I think there's uh, so much to be done. And one thing's for certain, our world is made up of really complex dynamics. Uh, and as a tennis ball whirls through the rain, uh, how do we represent the state of the world? Uh, is it even sufficient to describe perception in language? Uh, or perhaps in terms of control, as a tennis player teaches another how to swing the racket and says, yeah, that was pretty good. But remember to move your arm in a much larger C shape as you swing to hit the ball. Uh, how do we incorporate uh, that kind of feedback into intelligent robots? Uh, these are all still open questions that I'd like to pose to the community and really just get your help in figuring out. Um, 
I like to close out by returning back to this diagram here with language as the middleware to serve as the glue for robot intelligence. Uh, my colleague uh, Eric Jang wrote this amazing blog post where he cross references several works from literature to suggest that we have some reason to believe that the structure of language is the structure of generalization. And his article looks at it from different perspectives, including the sapir whorf hypothesis, which suggests that at least for humans, uh, language dictates cognition and our worldview. Uh, and perhaps this is one recipe for which we can build our intelligent machines. Um, but what's, what I'm most excited about is not just the generality of it all, but the fact that when language is the centerpiece of the system, you naturally have a medium by which you can communicate with people. Uh, for example, if we uh, go back to our live demo here um, and uh, recall that we had just asked it to put the yellow block uh, where we thought that it best fits and then asked it to put the other blocks in the same way. We can also ask uh, it a follow-up question, which is explain why you put the blocks that way. It will say uh, robot.explain, I put the blocks that way because they were the same color as the bowl. Nice. Overall, coming back to this, I believe that language as middleware provides a substantial opportunity in thinking about how we can engineer trust. Uh, building collaborative systems where by language uh, we can express intent and even ask for help. Um, a I think this is really a path forward for both competence and warmth, uh, ultimately for trustworthy robots. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank all of our collaborators uh, and interns and a lot of this work would not have been possible without them. Cool, thanks.